talk itself, there are a couple of things um, that I, I'd just like to briefly mention. The first one is, okay, people keep, people keep asking me, what exactly is Shadow Chat? So, a, a very short explanation. Uh, we are, we're an open source consultancy around the CPAN platform, completely by accident. Uh, we started off with a different business model, kept on basically fixing CPAN stuff when it got in the way, and eventually evolved into a company where basically we help customers use CPAN stuff and fix CPAN stuff and write modules and whatever. Uh, we host a few bits and pieces. Uh, most of the infrastructure for Catalyst, for DBIX class, for Moose, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, about two thirds of IRC.pull.org. Honestly, honestly, this wasn't really about um, what about wanting to look good or be nice. It was about the fact that every time this stuff broke, um, because my, because my team are all contributors to these projects as well. Um, we ended up running around trying to fix things. And because we were running around fixing things, we weren't working on things that actually made money. Uh, so we decided that paying for a few servers and um, just hosting the stuff so that it all worked was going to be simpler. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I, a, a, lot, a lot of what we get is, customer says, we've, we've spent two years building this code base, it works, we're making money. We're sure there's a lot of things that are wrong. Please come help us figure out which ones of those it's going to make money to fix. And I mean, I, I kind of feel bad pointing this out, but at the end of the day, it's people paying us to help them with CPAN stuff that lets us keep publishing CPAN stuff and lets me keep coming to random places and shouting at people uh, from a stage because, you know, there's other. Um, I have other committers on staff who are doing things. Yeah? Where is the cutting part of the plan where you push broken stuff on CPAN so people can pay you to fix it? <laughs> <laughs> and that is why we sell hours based consultancy and <laughs> not support contracts. <laughs> <laughs> because support contracts are fundamentally insurance against software sucking. <laughs> And I don't really like to make money out of that. I'd much rather make money out of making software better. I mean, maybe that's just me. Um, if, you know, if I wanted to make lots of money out of software sucking, I'd have gone to London, joined a bank, and become a Java programmer, right? <laughs> anyway, um, the other thing is we do, we do um, YAPC NA and YAPC EU, there's usually at least a couple of us there. We try and sponsor things. Um, I can convince um, Mark, who's the, who does all of the business stuff, to fly me to there. And then smaller workshops like this, um, the organisers are kind enough to find sponsorship to get me a flight and somewhere to sleep. Um, and then I spend more than that on beer, but that's my problem. Um, but this conference has been unusual. Okay, I, this, is, this is my second talk, but two talks in two days is not exactly a major deal. I haven't had a, a sudden request. I've lost a speaker. Matt, is there any chance you can do an extra, an extra talk? I haven't ended up running around trying to help with organization. And the other thing is, I mean, people were nice to me in my mood talk yesterday. I'm, 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 I'm not used to this. No, nobody's tried to screw with me. At, at YAPC, NA, and EU, they usually throw things at me while I'm giving a keynote. I'm not joking. <laughs> The pur pur purple stuffed toy octopuses seem to be the missile of choice. <laughs> Last year somebody handed Larry one to throw at me. That was even better. Sorry, we forgot. Alright, it, 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 it's fine, but you see, um, okay. French Pearl Workshop, like most workshops, is basically run by the community for the community. There's, there's, there's nobody making money out of this. It's not an O'Reilly conference. Um, and I... The organisers were coming around last night saying, um, you know, in order to help fund the French Pearl Workshop, please buy a t-shirt. And I thought, okay, well I could try and convince people to do that, but they're white. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't sell a white t-shirt to people. <laughs> so, um... There's some coffee left so we can dye them for you. <laughs> I figured there must be another solution, though, which is, 
People may know that I have famously been something of a skeptic about pearl sex, and I, I'm much more interested in stealing their good ideas and getting them into pearl, which is all very well, but I thought people might find it funny. So, for every 40 euros donated to the French Pearl Workshop, this should say today, I forgot to refresh the slides, we will start that again. There we go, now it says the right thing. For every 40 euros you donate between you today, I will spend an hour doing whatever Jonathan and Massac want me to do. <laughs> With any Within some reason, but whatever, whatever you guys think is going to be useful, I will quite happily do that. Um, so please help support, help support the conference because it's been really good fun and this is now the second time that the French Bowl Workshop has spent money on me turning up and only the first time I've actually managed to be here because the last time I managed to get chicken pox and spent two weeks on a sofa covered in... I remember the photo. Yeah, it was horrible. I did finally get round to reading Higher Order Pearl but that was the only good part. And seriously, I spent two weeks of no beer, no coffee, not wanting to move. Me, still and quiet. <laughs> so, please, I assume that the organisers will be able to figure out how to, how to add up the tally. I say today, which means you have until midnight tonight, local time. <laughs> After that... I'm afraid that I'm afraid all bets are off because I don't want to accumulate too much. And then just for the record, yes, support your conference. Yes, you get to laugh at me. So please don't give too generously. You know how much is missing? Tell us how much you need in terms of hours. Uh, no, I don't know how much you're missing. Find out. Uh, any, any, anything that, anything that, that doesn't end up covering things for here will go forwards to next year, so it's all good. The karma pays forwards one way or another. So, now we've got that part out of the way and you people can think about just how badly you want to mess with me. <laughs> I'll get on to the actual talk, shall I? Postmodern deconstructionism. So, my favourite programming language. I would, I would like to argue that my favourite programming language is CPAN. Uh, because, as Audrey Tang said some years ago, Perl 5 is just syntax, CPAN is the language. Uh, and then I managed to implement Devil Declare. Incredibly badly, fortunately somebody who was competent took it over and mostly fixed it. But at that point, we, I think we have to say, Perl 5 is just a virtual machine. CPAN is the syntax, the language, the API, everything. So I consider myself, I consider myself a CPAN programmer uh, where Unix is my IDE and Perl 5 just happens to be a virtual machine that's one component of that. So, um, CPAN, well, um, okay, C CPAN is, is, it's a near anarchy, but it's a, it's a means of collaboration, sort of. I, I would say what it really is, is independent cooperation, um, but it's not active cooperation, it, it, it's passive cooperation by the fact that we all upload things, we all use things. We don't necessarily talk to the maintainers and authors of all of the things that we're inter interacting with. <coughs> um, but having that centralised mechanism that is CPAN um, allows us to um, cooperate without needing um, to hit network effect problems. So you end up with collaboration-like results. Um, I mean, effectively, um, CPAN, is, CPAN is all about emergent behaviour. Uh, if you look at CPAN of 10 years ago, you had, a lot, you had a lot of modules and people would use modules, but they didn't necessarily talk as much. Now, uh, a lot of the modules that are coming out, there's a lot of people talking to each other, intentionally trying to make their APIs work together, um, intentionally trying to um, build. But that, that, that's emerged over time. Nobody has coerced this cooperation um, because, as, as history has shown, you know, um, trying to coerce cooperation among a group of programmers, right, no, I would rather herd angry cats. 
Um, so you, you end up with a culture of try and write things so that they can work together, which leads you to an ecosystem um, of interdependent code. Um, Milo, the man who founded Freenode, coined the term agalmia. Um, it, it's a useful one, uh, Google it up, he wrote an essay on it. Um, and the idea of an agalmia is something where the more everybody puts into it, the more every single member gets out of it. So the idea being that it, there's a snowball effect. The more the members of an agalmia cooperate, the more valuable membership of the agalmia is, which is why open source works by significantly different rules than, say, classic capitalist economics. Uh, so, I mean, you effectively end up with modules on top of modules on top of modules on top of modules. But somehow it all works. Um, because you, you have this culture of sharing, you, know, you have a situation where if a company does substantial things with a particular piece of code, they are base expected, if possible, to give some of the work that they've done back. Um, and that in fact, you, you know, we, we, we consider people to be bad citizens of this culture if they don't at least try and share in some way. Now, obviously in some cases code can't be shared, but then you have ideas and techniques. I mean. Um, uh, Google, in, in certain dimensions, don't give back code because they, that code is very specific to their environment. But they'll give presentations that explain the entire architecture, uh, which again makes it easy. So you share, you share ideas, you share tricks, even if you don't necessarily share code. Um, at which point, I, the ecosystem feeds itself, so it naturally goes, gets bigger and better over time. I mean, if you the the graph for the rate of CPAN uploads is basically um, like that over time. Uh, they they end up some it, it's close to doubling every year. Um, you know, pe people worry about um, the vibrancy of Perl as a community, and while these people are worrying, new authors are signing up to CPAN every week and releasing their first module. I think I think we're doing okay, right? Um, so I, I was looking at um, ecosystems, so pause index distributions by namespace. Um, there's 114 around Dancer, which for a project that's not been around that long is pretty impressive. Uh, 122 around the Modulicious stack. Uh, DBIX class has ended up with 133. I suspect the reason it's not higher is that there are certain types of extension that we still have to put into core in order to make things work. Uh, so we probably have, have a much higher number of modules. But I'm going by separate distributions here. Um, Moose. Moose is unsurprisingly um, fairly high up the list at this point. And that's, that's Moose and Moose X. Um, and the um, biggest ecosystem that I currently work with um, is the venerable and insane Catalyst framework, which seems to be doing quite well. Although I wouldn't be surprised if at least 200 of those have been obsoleted by something else in a different namespace by now. Possibly by stealing two-thirds of the code, which is great. This is open source. We love this. Um, interestingly, though, Plaque. Plaque is already quite high up, and yet it's not been around that long. And, uh, well, that's, that, that's really impressive and really quite interesting. Um, but I'll come back to that. Though I'm, I'm not so much stepping back here as stepping sideways into a little story of me trying to achieve something and failing completely. Which would be the case of DBIX class. Uh, because DBIX class was not originally meant to be an ORM in its own right. The original idea was to create an ORM toolkit. Uh, that may sound a bit odd. Uh, what I mean by that is um, that a simple project wants a simple ORM. A complicated project is going to need a complicated one. And I wanted to provide snap together components that let you produce whatever level of interface most fit the complexity of your problem space. Um, yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> Uh, DBIX class core was meant to be an example of how to snap together some of the components. But 
pretty much everybody just used that, never thought about the fact that they could do things a different way. And it eventually it reached the point where trying to maintain the toolkit idea was pointless because we had about three people using the toolkit and thousands using the ORM itself. So we, we focused on the thing that users actually cared about. Um, SQL abstract, uh, not quite so bad. Um, it, it, after the author disappeared, um, it got adopted by the um, DBIX class and uh, Law's DBIX data model teams. Um, and we, we, we refactored a fair amount of it. But people kept writing more SQL builders. I kept saying, look, we've got SQL abstract. It's the most popular one at the moment. Why don't I give you a commit bit and we, we, can, we can just rewrite it and figure out how to get something we all like. But people kept going, oh, no, no, I don't like the idea of that, no. Um, so uh, the, the result in this case, I, I, I count as partial failure because there's now at least half a dozen ORM-like things that do use SQL abstract, but there's still a lot that have built a lot of the same code again in ways that I don't think gain them anything. Um, and I, I, I really hate people writing code that seems to me to be not only a waste of time, but them spending time on that when they could be spending time writing code that I'd actually use. Uh, I'd much rather give them a commit bit to a, pro to a project that that um, already has traction than see yet another of the... Never mind. Um, I, and I think the main problem here is the problem of mechanism versus policy. Um, we can... The mechanism part is something that can very easily be shared because the mechanism is, you know, dealing with the vagaries of different databases or different web servers or... That, that sort of stuff is, that is a problem in and of itself. But the policy part, um, the part of, you know, how, do you how would you like to write your application, that's something that people tend to have very strong opinions about. And then there can be multiple val perfectly valid opinions in that. I, if, if you compare um, Dancer, which does its best to make um, writing small applications extremely easy and accessible, um, and then look at Catalyst, which is largely maintained by um, and optimized for um, people doing large-scale applications where you're going to end up with a huge code base and want to be able to keep maintaining that and adding features over time. Um, and they're, they're very different purposes and you need a very different attitude to design to serve them. Um, and that's the thing, syntax is policy. Um, your, your interface is policy. And even, even the architecture, the way you break down the concepts, is a form of policy because you know, not everybody thinks the same way about a problem. And so if, if you're going to maximize sharing, you need to find a way to deal with this. Um, and you, you can sort of ask at this point, is everything policy? Well, yes and no. Uh, because uh, you know, the one layer's policy um, becomes the mechanism for the next layer up. Uh, the trick is to define things in such a way that the people implementing the next layer up see your layer below as mechanism to them and not policy. So uh, making that explicit is, is kind of an interesting challenge. And so at this point, I'm going to come back to Plaque. Sort of. First, we need to go back into history and go back to um, Catalyst, at the point at which we had all of our own HTTP code. Um, Catalyst Engine, there were, we, there were as many Catalyst Engine implementations um, in sort of 2006, 2007, as there are Plaque implementations now, I think. About the same sort of order. Um, and we, we kept going, look, look, this stuff isn't actually anything to do with Catalyst. This is just all the rubbish that you need to talk to a given HTTP server. We kept going, oh, please, please, and steal the code. We, um, we'll, we'll switch to working with the separate version of the code, and then everybody can share it. Um, and the, the result of years of me begging people to steal our code? Complete failure. Uh, so, HTTP Engine uh, was a project started by a couple of Japanese Perl hackers uh, to try and build basically an independent version of this code. 
Uh, it, it was a brave attempt. It, it got quite a long way. But, first off, it, it, it defined an object model. Um, so people got into an argument about what methods should be on what object and how the object should talk. Um, the other problem was there was a big argument about which object system to use. <laughs> and, you know, this, this was in the days before we, before we could fairly comfortably say if the object system you're using is not one whose name starts with an M, you're wrong. <laughs> um, and, but, but the key thing is that um, by having objects, they codified the API um, in a way that meant there were certain pieces of policy baked into the design, uh, which couldn't easily be dealt with. Um, I, things like you, you couldn't easily share code in HTTP engine between um, normal request response code and streaming code. It, it, it plain didn't work very well. Um, so I, this is the thing. A, an API is interface, and interface is policy. So, okay, how do we fix that? Uh, I'll get to that. Um, so the result of that one, mostly failure but proved a lot of things could be done and um, I think informed a lot of uh, what came afterwards. So even though I never actually used HTTP Engine, I am hugely grateful to the developers because they were the first people who made a real attempt to do this. Um, Mojo. Mojo, believe it or not, was originally um, envisaged as a framework toolkit. Uh, with where a Mojolicious was meant to be the example. Are we, are we seeing where this, is, this one's going to go? Um, and the, the Mojo layer stuff was much less OO heavy. It was a very small number of methods. It did basically act as largely mechanism um, and had a bunch of interesting ideas in it. But it suffered from the everybody used the example problem, which then meant that over time it was quite hard to tell what of the code in Mojo was code that anybody should use and what of it was um, code that was there to support Mojolicious. And uh, the other thing was, because it was Mojo and Mojolicious, you ended up with a branding problem. Pe people saw them as the same thing rather than two separate things, one on top of the other. <coughs> Shipping it as a single distribution didn't help either. Uh, but uh, as, as Sebastian said, shipping it as a single distribution was an experiment in usability. I entirely agree. The part I disagree with him about is whether or not it was a successful experiment. <laughs> However, um, so the, the end result of that was, was, well, complete failure from the point of view of being a toolkit, but not a complete failure as a piece of software. Um, in the, in the um, same way as with DBIX class. The toolkit gets registered as nice try, but the framework did pretty well. So, cool, great. Um, plaque. Plaque is the interesting one. Because the thing is, PSGI is a protocol. PSGI is a protocol with a specification. Um, and the crucial thing about that is, because it's a because it's defined on its own, um, a protocol codifies an interface, but it codifies it in a way that allows you to treat it as a mechanism, and that is where things start to win. Um, PSGI.pod is the specification, it is only pod, it just describes things. And more interestingly, um, as well as being independent of any code, um, Plaque exists as a reference implementation. Now, okay, it's a reference implementation except 99% of code using PSGI is just using Plaque. But because it was designed and developed as a reference implementation, you still have that separation, and the separation is obvious to people. Um, the other key thing is, Plaque is explicitly only a toolkit. Um, Plaque request. Plaque request and plaque response are written to be used for middleware. They are written as something for writing toolkit components with. And it is explicitly stated, and Mia Gower will repeat again and again and again, it's not for application code and it's not for framework code. 
that's not what it's there for. Because as soon as you allow that, uh, you start running into all sorts of problems. Um, because frameworks and users are going to want um, extra shiny features that don't fit in code optimized for low-level toolkit work. Which is why I, I, will, I will point out, um, if you are using just plaque and putting plaque requests in your application code, you are doing it wrong. You may be doing it wrong in a way that works perfectly for you, and that's fine, but it wasn't actually designed for that. And making sure that it wasn't designed for that is part of why Plaque has been so successful. Um, you, this is notable in the fact that Plaque Request wraps the PSGI environment hash ref. Um, so it's explicitly a separate thing, um, which means that scope creep is prevented by design. Because when you get to your application, you're only past the hash ref. You never actually knew that Plaque Request was ever there. And that, that's a really important thing. Um, and the, the thing of having Plaque and PSGI, which are two fairly clearly different names, um, means that you don't have a branding confusion. Be, uh, people can see, here is a protocol, here is some code. And there, you, know, you, can use the you can use the protocol without using the code. Um, there are some non plaque implementations. Uh, things like um, Fearsome, which is an EV-based PSGI server, doesn't depend on Plaque at all. I mean, if, if you're going, by the time you're, you've got a deployed application using it, you will probably make the choice to use some Plaque stuff as well. But it absolutely does not require you to do so. Uh, the other nice thing about that is, having one specification and more than one implementation, even if there's a dominant implementation, keeps you honest. It's absolutely essential um, if you're trying to create something that's usable generally to have more than one downstream consumer. Um, because until you have multiple downstream consumers, you can't actually work out what needs to be generalized. Uh, which goes back to um, one of my favorite bad programming puns, which is premature generalization is the root of all eval. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, PSGI. The other interesting thing is PSGI is the environment is a hash ref, the request, the response is an array ref, and in a couple of cases where they want to get really clever and fancy, you're allowed to use a code ref. Um, and that's, they, that's nice because it, it's very simple, it's very explicit, and there is a great extent to, to which it is ugly, and that's a feature. Um, so why am I saying that ugly is a feature here? Because it means that you end up with no sugar and no syntax. Which means that it's very clearly a toolkit level piece of code. And does not provide any policy. In order to have pretty code, you have to load some module. Maybe a framework, maybe not. Um, and that provides you with the prettiness separately to the protocol itself. And the core implementation of the protocol. Um, and that has basically made sure that the policy stays outside and the mechanism stays inside. So you have, you know, lots of examples. All of these frameworks can work with PSGI. Um, Dancer and Modulish is still ship, I believe, um, their own HTTP servers as well, but are used via PSGI most of the time. Um, Catalyst and WebSimple now do not work except as PSGI, uh, which suits us fine because basically anything interesting in the Catalyst engine code got stolen by Plaque. Now, Miyagawa finally succeeded at the thing I've been failing to get people to do for years. It's wonderful. Um, and, be, and there's no arguing who owns an object, specifically because PSGI doesn't provide any. So you don't end up in a situation where you can have a clash. If you want to put your own things in the PSGI environment, you're totally welcome to, but you need to put it in your own key, in your own namespaced key set space, usually prefixed with your package name or something, so it's very clearly, this is a non-standard thing provided by this other piece of code. <coughs> so, at the end result of that, I would have put 181 distributions matching black already, fast growth, Wide adoption by frameworks, 
for the first time in the history in the history of Pearl, we actually pretty much all of CPAN seems to have agreed on something. <laughs> I'd say complete success. Um, so to uh, sort of summarise the reasons for this, because I, I, it's the reasons why that are really interesting to me here. Um, having a well-defined protocol that codifies purely the mechanism, um, having multiple implementations, um, and especially having the implementation separate from the protocol definition, um, very clear branding that, keep, that keeps um, the specification the mechanism implementation and the policy stuff on top as separate things with separate names. Um, scope creep intentionally being inhibited by the way it's designed. And finally, um, the refusal to let framework subclass plaque request and plaque response, so scope creep must stay outside of the plaque namespace. And you know, frameworks can do whatever whiz bang things they want. I'd quite like to see some of the frameworks share some of their request and response code, but that's not Plaque's problem, you know? Um, and I, what, what I really want to say is, I really wish we could expand this into other areas. Um, I'm working on a thing called Web Dispatch, um, which I'm fairly sure um, should be able to be a viable um, dispatcher implementation for WebSimple, Dancer and Catalyst. Um, the idea being that it, it, it's a simple dispatch tree that describes your request routing. Um, but rather than a lot of the router objects on CPAN that are meant to be, you call the router, you get a result, you do that. Um, this is designed to be a lot more interleaved with the framework, which gives you a chance to do um, more complex dispatch and sharing things in ways that um, aren't quite as doable in other spaces. And Web Dispatch is pretty much entirely built on code refs talking to each other. Um, specifically because it worked really well for Plaque, so I'm going to see if I can make it work as well for me. Um, I'm also working annoyingly slowly on data query, um, which is going to be basically data filtering and transformation. It's I've got a version of SQL Abstract that uses data query internally. DBIX class almost runs on top of it. Um, and that's very specifically hash refs and array refs. No objects whatsoever. Um, and we, we have a specification document that needs to be updated once we've actually got a couple of implementations going. But it's going to be very much a question of there will be a reference documentation and a reference implementation, and then people can plug whatever they want together. Um, and the choice of exactly how the objects work will be kept separate. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that data query can become PSGI for SQL, and Amazon, EC, Amazon Elasticsearch, and LDAP queries, and somebody else can write a MongoDB backend because I refuse to touch the thing again unless somebody pays me to. Um, but if I can convince somebody to do that, that means that's succeeded. Um, but I, I, I want to encourage you to think about other areas that, that could take this. Um, command line applications. Why do we not have a PSGI for command line applications? We have 87 getopt distributions. 87! Why, why do we need that many option parsers? Why do none of them talk to each other? I, it, it, it's even worse for the command and subcommand stuff. So if you're trying to build a rich command line API, you have about 20 different choices, none of which work together. So to trying to bolt a wrapper around another command, around another command, you, you're basically reduced to making system calls. Now, system calls are great, but wouldn't it be nice to have something just a little bit less low level? I mean, you know, if, if, if system calls were the answer to everything, then the CGI protocol would rule the world, right? <laughs> um, and PSGI effectively, is, if you look at it, is quite similar to, let's take CGI, pull it into the Perl 5 VM, customize it a bit to fit, um, and then run with that. So, why can't we do that <coughs> for the command line? Um, why has nobody done this yet? Uh, so, yeah, um, please, please, somebody invent PCLI.
um, because I have way too many things to do and absolutely no track record of making this work. See DBIX class failing completely at that particular task. Um, and me again, I was way too busy. So uh, somebody else needs to do, please, somebody, I, I, I will help, but somebody do that. Um, so and what I really want to see is, rather than lots of parallel ecosystems, I want to have lots of ecosystems stacked on top of each other um, in, the, in the same way that, you know, um, Catalyst sits on top of Plaque, sits on top of Perl 5. Catalyst sits on top of Moose, sits on top of Perl 5. DBIX class sits on top of SQL Abstract, which will soon sit on top of Data Query, which sits on top of Perl 5. And that this sort of layering approach, whereas each, each layer out, um, you, have a, you have the layer below's policy becomes the next layer's mechanism, will allow us to share a lot more code even though we want to have completely different architectures and completely different concepts at the top level. Um, and I, I really want to see more of that, because uh, the more we can set things up for that, the more the emergent ecosystem will basically give us better code and the ability to share more code and spend more time writing the things that are interesting, and more importantly, spending more time being done and down the pub with a beer, right? <laughs> Um, so, you know, the, the, the Terry Pratchett joke is often used, turtles all the way down. Um, CPAN approaches currently modules all the way down. Um, what I just want to see is CPAN all the way down. Um, so, the short guide to doing this? Define a protocol. Implement it separately. Take care of your branding. Find ways to make the design and the presentation inhibit scope creep and force anything that might be considered policy at this layer out to the next level up. And I think if you can do those five things, you'll get a long way towards succeeding. Um, I don't know, maybe that's step six? Maybe somebody needs to collect underpants. I've, I've no idea. Um, try it. It's worked once. It'll probably work again. Um, and if nothing else, if nothing else, creating another, pro another project like HTTP Engine, like my early attempts with DBIX class, a project that tries to do these things, doesn't get it all right, but, make, but informs the next person to try, is still worthwhile. You know, it, it, it's open source. We can steal from the things that didn't work as well as the things that did work. Because even the things that didn't have good ideas. Um, so, good luck, and thank you for listening. That's nice, but what I'm saying is we don't. Act, we we there, there, there's a, there's five or six big, quite good frameworks for making CLI programs. What I'm annoyed about is the fact that most of them don't share nearly as much code as I'd like. What's a protocol? Right. I I, I I I I want a protocol so we can take all of the best bits of mechanism out of all of the code we already have and steal that into one namespace that people can build CLI frameworks top. Just like Plaque stole all the best bits of HTTP code out of every single framework's code base. And now all of the frameworks can benefit from the best of all of it. No, it, 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 it's, 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 all, it's all about theft of code as well as ideas here. <laughs> Sometimes the timing is very important for, for being a success. So for example, DBI came very early, did the proper thing, and everybody uses it. And another example is templating systems, where 
we have lots of things around, and now it's too late to probably too late to to, to get all the templating system to one common. So people said it was too late to do it for web frameworks. Therefore, I consider Plaq to be a counterexample. I, 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 I will admit that DBIX Glass's wild popularity was largely because I released 0.01 about the same time that the Class DBI community exploded. <laughs> uh, so my, 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 my user base effectively got seeded by, by, by all of the people running away from Class DBI before it went horribly wrong. Well, more horribly wrong. Uh, <laughs> So yes, t time, timing can help, but I don't, I don't believe that Plaque's success is about when it was released. I believe Plaque's success is about how it approached the problem. Um, because th there were several previous tipping, there were, there, were, there were several points where basically pain had spiked, um, and then, you know, um, something could theoretically have come along. Um, I, I, I think, yes, maybe there is a right moment, but there can always be, there will always be another right moment. Um, the, the, the point is to actually prepare so that you have the right positioning to capitalize on that when it happens, uh, rather than a question of timing is everything. Don't you also think that uh, part of the success of Plaq uh, came from it being partly stolen from uh, other attempts in other languages, like Whisky and Iraq, uh, Whisky in Python and Iraq in Ruby, who have, which had more or less done the same thing? While perhaps, uh, I mean, Whisky has a fairly missed the point of a protocol, so it's not really a big well, success, but Iraq is a lot like that, and I'm pretty sure me and Ewa. Uh, sort of crack well, yes. I mean, the, the, the names were in, the, the names yeah. were intended to evoke those standards, exactly. but I'm at that time, Perl was lagging behind these languages, which had some kind of unified story for an HTTP stack. Right, but what, what, what I'm talking about here is why this attempt at a unified story succeeded. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, yes, he, he, he stole ideas from successful unified stories in other languages. I'm, I'm proposing stealing ideas from successful unified stories in other languages and our language to approach other problems. Um, so, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, <coughs> and if you, if you were trying to build, if you were trying to achieve the placification of a particular area, you would do well to look at other languages' versions of things. Um, I mean, I, I, I actually got my head around C sharp syntax in order to read up on the uh, Microsoft Link stuff in order to inform the data query design. So, yes, absolutely, go go out there and steal ideas. But what would, what what I'm trying to say is, there's a certain set of things you need to do to codify these ideas in such a way to maximize people's sharing of the use of them. Um, I mean, you know, yes, if, if, if you're wanting to produce the best reusable code possible, look at what everybody else did. But what, what's interesting to me is that HTTP Engine fundamentally had most of the same capabilities of Black but didn't catch on at all. Um, and it, it, it's a question of what was done differently that meant that Plaq succeeded and HTTP Engine didn't. I think part of Plaq's success is that he offered the Plaq implementation to frameworks. So he, he, he went to Catalyst and said, oh, I think, uh, and said, here's the Plaq version of what you're doing. And, and did that with Denser and did that with others? Well, most of the most of the Plaq version of what we were doing is um, our code with the object stuff like that. So <laughs> that, that, that there was there was there was a there was a great extent to which the the, the Catalyst engine hackers um, at the at the very least acted as guides um, to Plaq's wholesale theft of our code. So I, it was a very easy port for us. 
Um, but yes, but I mean, it, the, the, the point here is, if I'd written a HTTP engine was, was trying to make that connection with framework developers and trying to do the reaching out, but because the, the object model codified certain bits of policy, you couldn't get complete agreement. Um, again, I mean, Mojo tried to reach out as, to a number of framework developers as well, but again, it was it was perceived. I, I've not examined it in sufficient detail to say if that's correct, but again, it was perceived as being too much policy. Um, whereas Plax, here's a hash ref, here's an array ref. This is a real this is a really ugly low level syntax. Clearly, it is designed to be underneath the framework. I mean, seriously, the, the ugliness was a competitive advantage because no framework developer saw Plaque as ever being something that would compete with them. It, it, it was codified into the design, making it clear that he didn't, that Miyagawa didn't want Plaque to ever compete with a framework. Um, I, 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 th I think that, that, that's the interesting get. Basically, making the offer was important. But it's the way the design was done that meant that that offer was believed and therefore subsequently accepted. Are you encouraging uh, first level namespace pollution of CPAN? What? I don't care what you call the bloody thing, I want it to exist! <laughs> <laughs> If we decide we don't like don't like a name, we can read it later. I don't I, I don't care. I'd much I'd much rather have code with a silly name that works than no code at all. I still wish he hadn't called the web server Starman though. I am absolutely sick of hearing David Bowie in my head. <laughs> Un un unfortunately, being unfortunately being mean to me, Agawa just feels like kicking a puppy. So, <laughs> oh, come on, he's, he's about this big and really cute. You just can't. Right, that'll do. I'm going to go and fall over in a corner. Thank you very much.